Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, today we have uh, Matt Welsh from, uh, from Harvard. Um, a li little bit about Matt. Matt actually did his PhD with David Cutler, and also I think he worked with Eric Bloor right. at Berkeley, work on uh, internet scale services. And for those of people in, in that community, you probably heard of uh, Matt's work. More recently, Matt has been focusing on sensor network, and in particular, working on figuring out how to program uh, these uh, small devices, embedded devices. And uh, Matt's talk today is uh, market-based uh, resource management for SenseNet. So with that. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, first of all, for those of you um, in the room, some of you, I'm sure most of you know about sensor networks already. Uh, some of you may not. So I'll have a little bit of introduction. What I want to say is that the work that I've been doing here has been in collaboration with my grad student, Jeff Mainland, and uh, another professor at Harvard named David Parks, who's in the area of um, applying ideas from economics to computer science problems. So he's done a lot of very interesting work on you know, auction models and game theory and things like that. So when David and I got together, we started asking the question, how could we use these ideas from economics to solve problems in the sensor network space? So this is kind of where things got started. Um, so I'm sure most people here know what sensor networks are about. But in case you don't, the basic idea is to have very, very small, very, very resource constrained devices that have a little bit of computation very low bandwidth, very low power radio, modest amount of memory, and to have just a bunch of them scattered in the environment to do various kinds of sensing, computation, distributed signal correlation, things like that. There's been a lot of interesting applications for these. I'll talk more about it. Um, but the most important thing from the purpose of this talk is the fact that they have very limited resources. And so managing the resources on sensor networks is a very important problem, I think, if we're going to achieve long lifetime, and good data fidelity coming out of them because they have limited radio bandwidth. So if I had 10,000 sensors sharing 200 kilobits of radio bandwidth, you have to be very careful about how you manage that. So this is the, the basic problem that we're trying to solve. So let me give you the canonical application, which a lot of people have been working on, especially my colleagues at UC Berkeley and other universities, on using sensor networks to track vehicles. And I'll just use this as an example to motivate the problem. Um, so you've got a field, you've scattered some sensor nodes out in the field, you've got a base station there, and what you want to do is track the location of some vehicle that's traveling through the network, and in this case, preferably a large metallic object because we're using magnetometer sensors to detect perturbations in magnetic field, and that will tell you something about the position of the vehicle, okay? And this is a, the whole DARPA Nest project is doing this stuff, okay? So I'm not making this up. People are actually doing this. I have videos of this stuff working, if you don't believe me. But, um, and Alec, you know, Alec here is in these videos. It's pretty interesting. Um, so you've got a sensor network. You've got an uh, enemy vehicle. You want to determine the location of the vehicle. And so what happens is that the sensors near it will detect some change in the, in the magnetic field. And they will then transmit information over their radio back to the base station to indicate their sensor readings. And in this case, uh, the nodes will transmit something about their sensor readings and because we have limited radio bandwidth, it's often desirable to perform some aggregation of the data in the network. So if I have too many sensor readings to transmit, I may need to combine those results together into a single sensor reading that I propagate on because I don't have enough radio bandwidth to send all the data back to the base station. So there's some distributed computation, some signal processing, some aggregation, some communication going on in the network. So it's a fairly sophisticated program. It's not, not all that simple, as it turns out. So the problem that our group is working on is this, this issue of how do we manage the resources in the network so that we get long lifetime and good use of the radio, limited radio bandwidth. So if you just think about it for a minute, the action that every node performs, the sequence of actions that every node performs in the network has a really deep impact on a few things. For one thing, it has an impact on the accuracy of the data that comes out of the network because the more you sample, the more you communicate, the better your data is. But if you don't have enough energy or radio bandwidth, you can't 
do it continuously, obviously. Um, if I transmit and sample more data, then of course I'm using more radio bandwidth, so I might introduce more radio contention and collisions and, and, and cause data to actually be lost if I try to send too much. And of course, battery lifetime. So the battery lifetime is something that, that people want these things to last for months or years, so you have to be very careful about how you schedule your operations. So the basic way this is done today is the programmer sits down and says, okay, I'm, here's a static schedule for every node in the network. Very simple. Every in seconds, every second, I'm going to wake up, sample my sensor, listen for a while, receive some data from other nodes, combine it together, and transmit a new message. So it's a, just a very simple periodic schedule that every node performs. And of course, the periodicity of the schedule affects all these things, the accuracy, the radio bandwidth usage, the battery lifetime. But of course, this is really suboptimal because it's not necessarily the case that every node should perform every action at exactly the same rate. It should depend very much on what's actually happening in the network. We'd like the schedule, the set of operations that every node performs to depend on sort of the stimulus from the environment, if you will. So for what the, one of the goals of our work is what I call self-scheduling, which is nodes should determine their own schedule based on their local state, such as where, whether or not the vehicle is nearby. If the vehicle is nowhere nearby, I should probably not be taking very frequent sensor readings because it's not giving me any useful information. Likewise, if I'm this node way out on the corner of the network, I probably shouldn't be listening to my radio all that frequently for incoming radio messages because no one's going to send me anything. Okay, so the individual nodes should decide what they're going to do based on their local state, not some sort of regimented uh, global schedule that was defined by the programmer. And secondly, we want the nodes to adapt to changing conditions. For example, if a vehicle comes near me, I probably should ramp up the rate at which I sample my sensor to get better data about that vehicle. Once the vehicle's moved away and I'm not getting good data about it, I should ramp down my sampling rate so that I'm not wasting energy taking sensor readings that are useless. So there's two things going on. We want the nodes to specialize their behavior and we want them to adapt over time. Okay? And doing this kind of simple static scheduling, which is the standard technique today, doesn't achieve either of those goals. So far, so good? You can interrupt me with questions if you have them. Okay, so when we started thinking about this problem, um, as I said earlier, the inspiration was coming from ideas in economics. And working with David Parks, I wanted to ask the question, well, could we use ideas from economics? So it's a little bit about putting the cart before the horse. I'll admit that. That there are many other techniques we could use to address this problem. We decided to take an economic model first just to see where we would go with it. And I'll show you in a few minutes that we've actually moved into some other areas like reinforcement learning. So um, why might we want to use economics in the first place? Well, the reason it seemed attractive from the beginning was that, first of all, markets tend to operate in a decentralized fashion, that we don't necessarily have centralized control of what all the agents are doing in a market. Individuals are making their own decisions based on their observation of the, the environment. So this seems to map well onto a sensor network. Uh, secondly, the individual nodes, they're, they're just being very greedy and they're, they're trying to, in some sense, make more profit, if you will. And I'll describe later what I mean by that. But this seems to map well onto a decentralized process. We want to avoid centralized algorithms here for obvious reasons, which is the communication overheads would probably make that very uh, non-scalable. We don't want to centralize how this is done. Um, and finally, um, there's a lot of theory about economics that talks about how markets realize globally efficient resource allocations. And I don't want to claim that it's just, you know, that we shut the door on that problem from a sensor network perspective, but because there's so much great theoretical work on using economic ideas for distributed optimization, we thought, hey, let's try this out in a sensor network context. So uh, uh, Mike Wellman at um, University of Michigan has been doing some work on this area um, not in a sensor network context, but what he has, he has this system called market-oriented programming. And the idea is to use a market to control a distributed system and to achieve some kind of distributed optimization. And so um, his system does rely on a centralized process to set prices. And I'll get back into some of this later. But we were inspired by some of this work because we said, hey, we could potentially apply these ideas to sensor networks. Yes? 
Doesn't most economic uh, theory assume that information is globally known? It's just that what's local is your, your local uh, uh, perspective. That's true. So, so one of the things that, for example, most market work assumes is that everybody knows what the prices are. OK, that's a good point. And I'm going to get back into how we manage this later on. But you could really imagine doing this in a decentralized fashion where individuals don't have global information it may yield less optimal solutions, but we still think we can move forward with that. But that, that's definitely a good point. Let me keep going, and then I'll get into the details, and all this will make more sense. So we have this um, programming model, or this resource allocation model, that we call market-based macro programming. And what I mean by macro programming is this idea of let's control the global behavior of the whole network rather than program the individual devices. Okay, so this is kind of a research agenda of mine. Uh, and the basic model in the market-based macro programming is that the individual sensor nodes are acting as agents that sell goods. And a good could be defined in a number of ways. For example, a sensor reading is a good. The ability to transmit a radio message, that's another good. Okay, so depending on the application, we could define a set of goods. Every good is produced by some action that generates the good. So for example, taking a sensor reading, turning on the sensor, generates a sensor reading good. Turning on the radio to listen for an incoming radio message may or may not produce a, sense, uh, a radio message good. Because if nobody sends me a radio message while I've got the radio on, I may not get one. But if I do get one, then I've now got a radio message good. So far, so good, so to speak. Anyway. Um, now, every action, of course, has some energy costs associated with it. So the main thing that we're concerned about in this work for now is energy. Uh, I'm not talking so much about radio bandwidth, although that's a very important problem. Mainly going to talk about energy. So the energy cost for each action that a sensor node can take, it actually varies a, an enormous amount over multiple orders of magnitude. So for example, sampling a sensor is very cheap. But turning on the radio to transmit a radio message consumes many, many, many more joules just because of the nature of the hardware. Yeah? Is the reason you're talking about energy rather than bandwidth that energy is a local resource and bandwidth is the commons that everybody can pillage? Um, that's one reason. It's easier to start with energy because it is a local resource. But I think these ideas, we could apply them to bandwidth as well. You just have to have a notion of how much local bandwidth was available in some sense. The problem with bandwidth is that it's, you have tried to the commons, right? I mean, if you're, if you're using yes. local profit optimization, then it's, it's always in some local node's best interest to steal bandwidth unless there's energy constraints preventing that. Uh, right. Or it may be the case that um, you actually have an artificial constraint where nodes wish to achieve fairness across their neighbors. And so they actually are incentivized to share bandwidth. You could do that, too. OK. okay. Um, so one thing that I want to point out here is that we're not assuming self-interested nodes. We're not assuming that random people are programming their nodes in order to be greedy and get the best thing out of the network. And so you wrote a node program right, right. and Feng no, wrote know, a... I just, it's just not, not clear to me that um, the, I, I'm not knowing anything about market theory. It's not clear that markets, market theory would hold up if you started adding constraints like that. that uh, you, it actually does. You can do it in that, in that way. I'll, I'll talk some more later. But um, I think it's important to point out what we're doing is we're programming nodes to be self-interested in a particular way. OK, we're not, we're not assuming malicious behavior, in other words, um, which makes life a lot easier. Um, OK, so finally, every good has an associated price. So if I turn on my radio to listen for an incoming radio message, and I do receive an incoming radio message, I now produce that good, I get paid for it. I make some profit. OK, and the, the way we program the network, the way we cause the network to take actions is basically by setting prices for all the different goods. And that's it. OK, I'm going to get into the details again in a second, but just this is the basic idea. Is the price given with energy? Uh, I'll, let me get to that in a second. OK? Where would, be, uh, where would be the utility of the data? Let, let, me, let me get it. I'm going to get into the details. I'll show you in a second. Yeah? OK, so the basic idea is that the nodes are now just trying to maximize their profit. They're trying to make the most money, but they have a limited amount of energy to use to, to make money. OK, so it's pretty simple, pretty simple model. Um, so the first thing is, where do the prices come from? And in this work, what we're assuming is that we can globally advertise the price information. 
two assumptions here. First, that it's, in, that, that it's possible to do that efficiently. And it turns out that there's a bunch of protocols out there, gossip protocols, for disseminating global information in a sensor network. And that can be done pretty efficiently. Secondly, um, that the prices don't change too often. So in other words, we don't have to do that all, all that much. So, um, so that what we would use is some protocol. There's something called Trickle. There's a bunch of other protocols out there that would let me basically efficiently propagate this global price information everywhere. It's also important to note that the prices are small. It's not like sending a bunch of information out there. It's like if we have five actions and we'll have five prices. So it's you know a few bytes of information. It's not a lot. Okay. I'm going to get into that later on. For now, I'm not changing the prices yet. I'm going to show you in a minute how we evaluate this. But um, we're starting, we're basically setting the prices once and then doing an evaluation. OK, so what the nodes do then is they've got this price information. And what they're trying to do is try to make the most profit. So what they do is they evaluate the utility function for each action. OK. And they pick the action that has the highest utility. Yes? Uh, a bit off subject, but just now there's a talk in the other room about selfish agents working together. Well, and we should get together and have this talk. <laughs> Maybe one way? in the other side of the room. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well. Um, so so what the, the utility is, there's several things in the utility. And I'll show you some math in a minute. But um, basically, the utility is, an, is a function of the price of the action, of course. Um, the amount of energy availability. So if I have a little bit of energy available, but such action takes a huge amount of energy, then I can't take that action. So it basically has no utility to me. And other dependencies, data dependencies on the action. So for example, the action to aggregate multiple items, multiple sensor readings together into a new sensor reading, I'm not allowed to take that until I have acquired multiple sensor readings. right? So there's a data dependency that has to be met. Likewise, I'm not allowed to transmit a radio message until I have something to transmit. And it seems obvious, but you have to include that in the model. OK, so the energy budget, there's a lot of different ways that we could model this. We chose a simple token bucket scheme. And the basic idea is that a node has some total capacity of energy that it is allowed to store up. You could think of this as your battery capacity, or if you have a a, a capacitor or something that's storing energy for you. That's the total amount of energy you're, you're allowed to hoard. And taking actions drains that energy, energy down. So every action has an energy cost, as I said. And the bucket refills with energy at some rate rho. And the rate is chosen by the system designer to basically give the lifetime of the network. For example, um, if I give a rate of 1,000 joules a day, that's putting a bound on how much energy a node can consume. I'm telling a node, look, you can't consume more than 1,000 joules a day. So if you start out with you know, 10,000 joules, that gives you 10 days of lifetime. Does this make sense? So it's a very simple model, but there's other ways you could do this as well. Um, now let me talk about what the utility function really is. The utility function that we're using is incredibly simple. And we could add all kinds of more complicated things. We actually started with something that was fairly more sophisticated than this. And it turned out that it didn't work so well. And I'll get into that in a minute. But the utility that we're using is the, for each action, the utility of the action is the expected profit. And the expected profit is simply the price of the action times the probability that you're going to get paid if you take the action. So remember what I said earlier about if you take an action, you may or may not produce a good. So if I turn on the radio to listen for an incoming radio message, someone may not send me a radio message. So I may not actually get paid for that, that action, meaning I wasted the energy. right? So the utility represents my expected profit. If the price is 10 and 50% of the time I get paid, my expected profit is 5. OK? And um, we estimate this probability on the fly? Uh, yes. So um, this probability that you're going to get paid, every time you take the action, you update the probability. And we use a simple, you could do this a lot of ways. We just use a simple exponentially weighted moving average. Yeah? So there's a hidden assumption you get feedback whether somebody was listening to you. That's right. So. Uh, well, actually, it's the other way around. If I turn on my radio to listen, 
No, for listening, but if you talk, you have to, how do you know somebody's listening? Yeah, so we just, we just assume that at the Mac layer of the radio that there's an acknowledgement that goes back. Okay, so this feedback that you, you brought this up, thank you for bringing that up, that's very important in this model, that the node actually knows when it took an action that was profitable. Okay, so let me give you another example just to make it clear. If I take a sensor reading and the sensor reading is very weak and it doesn't tell me that the vehicle is nearby, I don't get paid for that either. It was a useless, it was a waste of energy. So what a node is doing by getting this feedback is it's determining whether or not the thing that it did was a useful thing to do. Yeah? Who pays for the information? The other node that receives it or uh, some global god? The way we do it right now is very simple. The nodes basically pay themselves. Remember, we're not assuming that nodes are trying to cheat here, so there's no reason that they would. So they basically know when I take an action, they know, okay, I got paid for that or I didn't get paid for that, so they pay themselves. It is true that you could imagine some actions where a node would be unable to pay itself because it needs some other information from another node. For example, I don't know, if I sent some stream of sensor readings and the base station put them together and said, oh yeah, that was useful, I guess it could issue a payment later on back to the node. But now you have a feedback loop that's got some delay in it. For this very simple model, the node immediately knows whether it was paid. Uh, keep in mind that, as I said earlier, the utility function is conditioned by these dependencies on the action. There's two dependencies, whether or not I have enough of energy available to take the action and whether or not the data dependencies have been met. So the utility function could be zero for an action if neither of those conditions are true. Okay, so this is a very, very simple model, but there's a problem with it. Uh, the problem is that a node l that learns that an action is unprofitable will never do it ever again. It'll say, well, the beta went to zero because I never got paid for turning on my radio to listen for incoming radio messages. So, you know, to heck with that. I'm not going to listen for radio messages anymore. I'm not getting paid for it. And that's bad, right? We, we don't want nodes to get trapped in some local minima where they don't, where they don't look for other opportunities for profit. Remember that we're, we're assuming the network is dynamic. So the vehicle is moving around the network. So if I'm taking sensor readings and not seeing the vehicle, that doesn't mean it's never going to happen in the future. So I really want to be exploring for new opportunities for profit. I don't want to just stay stuck in one state. So the way we do this is a fancy term called epsilon greedy reinforcement learning, which is really a fancy way of saying most of the time I take the action with the highest utility, but sometimes I take a random action. Okay, so it's, think of like simulated annealing or something. Sometimes I go uphill. For past performance, is no guarantee of future performance. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, it's the disclaimer on your e-trade. Yes? Uh, just assume a prior. Yes, yeah, you can that way too. Just assume a prior. There's so lots of, so, so, as I said at the bottom, well, I guess I said, I said machine learning at the bottom. There's lots of other ways that we could do this. This is the chapter two of Sutton Bartow. I mean, this is, very simple, but we chose it to be very simple because it seems to work well and we didn't want to do anything more complicated until we'd understood this one. Yeah? Would this random action be a good rationale for Scott Grove is getting drunk from time to time? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, all right, but it's, it's very simple and so what it's now doing is a node is mostly taking the action and so think of this epsilon parameter here as the I'm going to pick something that I don't know it to be profitable. I'm going to turn on my radio even though I don't think that there's any incoming radio messages. But hey, if there is an incoming radio message, I, I'm going to learn very rapidly that that was profitable. Okay, so by taking random actions, I'm potentially wasting energy. I might be doing things that is wasting energy, but I am looking for new opportunities for profit. There are so many interesting machine learning algorithms we could use to tune this system. I'm doing this very simple one right now. For example, the dumbest one that you could name is tune that parameter epsilon over time based on what seems to be happening. Okay. Let me give you an example just to show you what the utility functions look like. So um, the node down here in the corner of the network, I've got four actions shown here. Listening for incoming radio messages, sampling the sensor, aggregating data, which is taking multiple sensor readings and combining them into one, and transmitting data. And just as an illustration, this is not actual data, it's just an illustration, this node down here has a low utility for listening for incoming radio messages because there's nobody near it that's going to transmit to it. Um, but he's close to the vehicle, so he has a high utility for sampling, aggregation, and transmission. Okay? Um, another node in the network 
like this guy here, um, has a high utility for listening because other nodes are routing data through it. Now we didn't set these parameters, they're learned by the nodes. Okay, they start out at a random value, they learn these. It's not near the vehicle, so he doesn't have any reason to sample its sensor, but it does have high, high points for aggregating and transmitting because data is coming through it that it has an opportunity to aggregate and transmit. And finally, this node down here doesn't have a high utility for anything, so the good news is he'll save his energy. He won't, most of the time, he's not going to do anything. He's going to sleep. And that's exactly what we want. Okay? Keep in mind, we didn't actually program all this behavior. In some sense, we set up the conditions and set the prices, and the nodes are learning what to do. So that's kind of the, kind of the beauty of it. Um, I mean, the nodes, this is very simple. If you're asking the question, well, gee, you're doing this economics and reinforcement learning, and you've got sensor modes, and they've got 8-bit processors and 4K of RAM, are you out of your mind? I mean, this is actually very simple to implement. There's very little state that a node, ne node needs to maintain. All the stuff can be done with cheap operations. This is not, we're not doing, that's one reason we're not doing really sophisticated reinforcement learning techniques that require lots of state and building a model and all this kind of fun stuff because we don't have the memory for it. So there's an interesting question about how sophisticated could we get, but we wanted to keep it really simple. Secondly, the nodes are going to adapt. So these, re these utility functions are going to change over time based on what's happening to a node. It's going to learn its beta parameter. And as the vehicle moves around the network, its utility for different actions is going to change. So this is not a static, this is not a static uh, um, optimization problem. It's How fairly price dynamic. Price so far, the pri I'm talking in the condition where the prices aren't changing. I'll get to a. Let me get to that in a few slides. I think I'm going to talk about changing prices. Also, does the price change based on how much energy you have left? Because maybe I missed something. But okay, this, like is, this is the question I meant, to, I meant to address that earlier. I'm sorry. So you're going to notice here that energy is not part of the utility function directly. It's an indirect thing, which is if I don't have enough energy, the utility is zero. What a node is not doing is directly trying to value energy. It's not saying, well, I've got a really high energy cost action and a really low energy cost action. Which one should I take now? So you always spend it if you got it. So, so I, I spend, spend it, it if I've got it. it. So that means if, if something has a tiny fraction of probability of, of, of being profitable and it costs you know, any amount of energy, you're like, well, yeah, I, I can afford that. As and long as I have it, yes. So, so that, suggests, that suggests two things. One is nodes will never sleep. It's not true. I'll show you in a minute. They're going to burn energy at the rate they can. And the second thing it suggests is that um, they're, you're always going to perform the cheapest operation first if, if multiple things are available. And you're never going to get around to being able to afford the expensive one because you're spending your pennies. That's right. OK, that's a great point. That's a, this is a very good point. So the first one in terms of never sleeping. In fact, they do sleep when they don't have enough energy to take any action. That has a non-zero utility. I need to point this out. If, I, if all my utilities are zero, because you know nothing's happening around me, I'm going to sleep by default. Well, they'll be vanishingly small, right? You get that one node that had like low utility across all the four. Yeah. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. I should have explained that. We, what we do is we threshold that. So if the utility is below some small value, we we set it to zero. Right? I mean, profit, you subtract the revenue from the cost, and you're modeling the revenue, but you're not modeling the cost. And it seems like you'd want to model the cost. To okay. So thank you. This is what I need to was going to explain. So we tried that first. And that was our original model. And it didn't work very well for the following reason. Basically, the energy cost for different actions, as I said earlier, varies very widely. So taking a sample uh, action consumes like minuscule amount of energy. Transmitting a radio message spends thousands and thousands of times more energy than that. So what ends up happening is, say I sample my sensor a few times, and I notice the vehicle's nearby. Suddenly, by using a tiny bit of energy, I get huge profit for the amount of energy that I used. So I overvalue my energy, yeah. meaning that I never transmit. The revenue was too high then. I mean, the price was too high, right? I mean, uh, so it's all, yeah, so one way of fixing that is to play with the prices. But what we decided to do was even simpler, which is to say, look, it's all about this energy budget. I have no problem with how nodes are going to use their energy. They can use their energy any way they want as long as they stay within the bucket. You said, well, they're never going to sleep because you know, they're just going to burn all their energy. Good. They're supposed to burn their energy within this limit row here. There's no problem with well, that. You, you, you do this picture where the guys in the corner of the networks were, were sleeping, you know, kind of, in a sense, sa saving their energy up for the time when they have to do something. But they're not going to do that, right? I mean, Yes, they will. Because of the threshold. Because of the threshold on the, on the utility. Well, are you going to have the other effect where? Uh, Matt, if I imagine like the bucket's empty because I'm sleeping, and now I get a little bit of energy trickling into my bucket at this right row, yes. 
then the only thing I'll be able to do will be one of the low energy. That's energies. exactly okay. So that's so the more I'll immediately use that up and go back to sleep. And so you'll never get that's energy right. in your bucket to actually do something. Uh, that is the more serious problem. Let me address that first, which is um, our current scheme is, as you can tell, extremely myopic. The node is not thinking into the future and saying, well, hey, if I saved a little more energy, I could take that more profitable action. Right. It's saying, I've got this much energy, I'm going to use it. It's like the kid, you give him the allowance and he goes and spends it at the It's what I did as a kid anyway. You just spend the $3 right now instead of saving it for next week, or you get $10. So certainly that's an issue. There's ways of fixing that, obviously, which is just to build a little bit more complexity into the learning scheme. So nodes can reason into the future about what profit they might have in the future if they were to allow energy to store up. It does, I'll show you in a minute. It seems to work anyway. I would, I'm not going to say it's optimal. I'm just going to say it, it actually happens to work. Uh, two things. Uh -huh. uh, one is that basically uh, the business of repeated sampling, you should really reduce the value of an extra sample immediately after the first sample. Right, yes. Hang, it's right. moving that fast. And the second That's is, another, yes. the model you have will work if you have a solar cell and it gets charged. If you run off a fixed battery, it's a very bad model because you know you spend all your energy on chit chat and the battery is flat. And then the tank comes and... Well, the way we do that is, is, again, I mean, this capacity C, we can pick that to be whatever we want. It doesn't have to be a, the capacity of a solar cell. We could simply say, you know, even though we're running off a battery, say we're running off a fixed power source. And we could set the capacity, the depth of the bucket, to be some limited amount, meaning you're not allowed to hoard more energy than some amount. Exactly. So still, your model says when you run, run out of that bucket, you're dead. You're quiet. No, yes. That, that capacity isn't the capacity of the whole battery. The, the example he gave earlier was that mm. you know, maybe the bucket only holds 500 joules, but you've got a uh, you know 10,000 joule battery. That's oh, right. so you refill it by bulking. You're, 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 vir you're virtually yeah. filling the bucket, oh, but you're not allowed right. to empty it all the way. That's out. right. That's right. So Matt, so how often? So when you're filling the bucket, I mean, what's the quantity which you're dropping stuff into the bucket? So really, because if it's, I think, uh, I, and I'm not sure if I understand what you mean, but every time you take an action, you deduct something from the bucket, and then you look at how much time you've spent. Every day you put a thousand joules in. No, you you do it you do it continuously. So it's more continuously. Continuous. Okay, so I guess the question I was originally going to ask uh -huh. minutes ago, and then also other people started So in the case, so you said every time you take an action, you'll... <laughs> I'm sorry, Jeremy, I want to finish this. So in the case, so you said if you're taking an action, you'll look at how long it's been and sort of fill up appropriately. Yes. What if you're not taking, what if you're sleeping? At what point then do you go to put some in? Um, I think, I, I'm not sure exactly what the import of the question is. I mean, basically, when you, what we do when you go to sleep, is you sleep for some fixed length of time. So it's not like you sleep forever. Right. You sleep for, say, a second or so half a second. And then when you wake up, you say, oh, OK, I slept for half a second, so this is how much energy I now have in my bucket. I'm just, I mean, I'm still trying to get back to how does a bucket ever have enough energy to let you do something expensive? It works. And I, I think and this, what, and this may the, the reason that it works. If you sleep for a second, if that accumulates enough energy to let you do something expensive, then that'll solve the problem. Let me, let me, if you don't mind, let me go on, because I'm going to show you the operation of this. And I think it will address some of these questions. Can I ask one quick question? Yes. Um, so they're worried, I'm sort of, I'm worried about the converse problem, the opposite problem. So what they're talking about is you get a penny and you spend it immediately. Yes. I imagine, let's say you start and you've got a thousand pools. Yes. You've got this nice big buck full of energy and then you discover that it's profitable to sample. So what prevents it from suddenly just sampling at maximum rate until the bucket is empty because now it's found this profitable action? In other words, there's no model for it. There's an opportunity cost for using the energy because there might be something that's even uh, This is a detail I probably should have explained. Um, the, you're right. You need to be careful about this. And one thing is um, there's a limited amount of memory that a node can use to store samples. So if it buffers up, say, 1,000 samples, it's out of memory. So it's not going to, that action is no longer going to be profitable. So it mm -hmm. stops doing that. One way of doing it. But yeah. So, so this discussion on, on yeah. having your. Uh, uh, having a um, minuscule profitable operation being repeated over and over yes. and over again. That assumes actually that the uh, node is not valuing the information properly. So, right. uh, and that would not happen if the node was getting the feedback from its neighbors. If, if, if it was paid by the neighbors for the information, mm -hmm. because the other, the other node would say, okay, you already told me that you were right. seeing a tank. I don't care that you're seeing it again. That's right. Tell me when you're not seeing it. That's, that's what right. I want to hear. Well, there's another, that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is just to throw in another constraint, which is, you know, if I've sampled more than 10 times in a row, there's no new information to be gained by doing it more, so I'm going to stop doing that now. OK, let me go on. I'm going to show you how this works. I think these are very good suggestions, though. We have played with some of these ideas. 
The, the other thing that's a little bit interesting here, and we didn't expect this, but once you think about it, it makes sense, that the fact that nodes are getting feedback based on which actions were successful means that there's some natural balance or equilibrium. I don't mean like economic equilibrium, but I mean natural balance in the system about what fraction of nodes are doing what. So for example, the number of nodes listening for incoming radio messages tends to be in balance with the number of nodes that have something to transmit. Meaning that if I've got very little to transmit right now, nodes are not turning on their radio to listen for incoming messages because they learned in the past that it wasn't profitable to do so. So they power down their radio. So one way of thinking about this is we accidentally implemented some of these duty cycling radio, you know, radio um, ad hoc duty cycling protocols. We didn't mean to do that, but it, it sort of emerged from the way the system was built. Um, and I, I've already mentioned that you can control the network with prices. There's a question about how general that is. It, it, with our current scheme, it's very simple. So it's not obvious to me that you could get any, perform, any behavior over the network just by setting different prices. But I'm going to show you in a minute. We haven't told the system here that it's tracking vehicles. And you said four prices. Four, four we prices. basically set four prices. And we set the four prices out, and nodes do stuff. So the question is, how, you know, what, what range of behaviors can we get out of the network just by changing the prices and nothing else? All right, the way we evaluated this initially was in simulation. And we have a, this is using the TOSIM, TinyWest simulation environment. So it's a very, very detailed simulator. It gets down to the hardware level of the moat. So we actually believe that this is fairly reasonable. It doesn't abstract away too much. We have 100 nodes here. And the vehicle is moving in this circular path here at some rate. So we just wanted to excite different parts of the network by moving it around in a circle. And moving it in a circle meant it was deterministic, so we could know we could, we could run multiple runs and the vehicle be in the same place each time. And the, the nodes use this, these green lines show the routing paths. And we're using GPSR, which is a simple geographic routing protocol, um, to do the routing. So the first, uh, oh, and before I go on, we needed to compare this to something. And it's a little tricky. What do you compare this to exactly? It's not like we can go pluck some you know, random vehicle tracking code from somewhere and it's going to run and make sense and do the same thing. So we tried our best to implement what we thought represented the other way of doing node scheduling, which is, as I said earlier, the static schedule where nodes are basically given a fixed rate at which they perform the actions. Um, so that was the first one we implemented. Some people on the first paper submission said, well, this is a straw man. You should do something more complicated. So we did dynamic scheduling, which is a node looks at its energy availability and it turns up and down the rate at which it does this schedule based on the amount of energy available. Note that I don't know of any actual sensor network that does this. So I think we probably could have published a paper just on that. <laughs> but it's very simple. So it's, it's not much of a contribution, but it, it's a little bit more advanced than what's done today. Finally, we implemented, um, you, some of you know Kameen Whitehouse at Berkeley. He has this system called Hoods, which is a way of implementing vehicle tracking systems. And so we read the paper and the code very carefully, and we basically borrowed the, we didn't take the code exactly, but we re-implemented the same tracker that they evaluate in their paper. So that's really meant to represent another published paper that does vehicle tracking. OK? Yes? But I don't, I don't know about the last one. The, the one you described in the middle sounds like it's not adaptive. So if you move the nodes around, if you turn off the nodes and so on, it's, it's going to fail. But well, yours is sure adaptive. what do you mean? We're not looking at those cases here anyway in terms of moving yeah. the nodes around and having them fail. But the dy what I mean by dy dynamic node scheduling is a node looks at the amount of it. So let me, let me make sure I'm clear here. Depending on where the node is in the network, it's going to get excited to take different actions. So different nodes use more or less energy. So in the dynamic scheduling case, the nodes that have used more and more of their energy budget have less energy to spend. So they scale back the rate at which they perform actions. So every node is trying to meet some energy target, daily energy target. And they're doing that by individually picking the rate at which they run this program. OK? Um, so some initial results. Question is, all right, can we track vehicles? And how accurate is it? Um, so the, this is a CDF. Of the, the tracking event error in meters is shown here. And this means, what I mean by this is when the base station receives the estimate of the vehicle's location, how far is the vehicle from that true location? And remember, the vehicle's constantly moving, so it's going to have some error anyway based on 
when you know, vehicles move during the time that the data has been routed to the base station. Um, and this is the, the CDF. So the first thing to note is the, the yellow and the green lines are the static and dynamically scheduled trackers that we implemented, kind of the, the standard way of doing things. And as we see, they get the best performance, so they're pretty accurate. Um, the hood system, the black line here, is one of the least accurate, and that's basically because it uses a particular way of, of aggregating data that tends to lose information. So it wasn't actually a very good tracking algorithm, as it turns out. Um, and the red, blue, green, and purple lines here represent the market-based approach with different settings for the price for listening for incoming radio messages. So what we did was we just set the, the, all the prices for the other actions to be the same value, and we turned the knob on one of the prices and then ran it over and over and over again to get these lines. And what we, what we see is if the price for listen action is 15, which is, you know, in some you know, relationship to the other prices, then the performance of the tracker is pretty good. It's almost as good as the statically scheduled version. Okay, I want to point out, first of all, that my goal here is not to get a more accurate tracking algorithm. I'm going to show you in a minute that what we achieve with this is far better energy uh, efficiency. Okay, but we're close. So we're ballpark in terms of being able to track the vehicle. But if I turn up the price or turn down the price for the listen action, then I have some degradation in performance. So lesson number one, prices matter. And the question now is, how do I set the price? It's a big open question. So something that we're still working on. But um, one thing you're going to notice here, the listen price for zero means that nodes should never turn on their radio to listen for incoming radio messages. So how on earth is any data getting to the base station? Well, the base station is assumed to be powered and always listening for incoming radio messages. So what's happening is these, this data is only being received from the nodes that are right next to the base station. OK? So there's still some data there. Let me give you a picture of how the market-based moat is running using this algorithm. So this is a fairly um, complicated diagram. Time's on the x-axis. The actions taken by the node, this is looking at one node, are shown here. So there's a dot when an action. So at this point in time, the node took an aggregate action. What's happening is this is a node that's along the vehicle's path. And the vehicle is far away, and it's moving near the node. And then it's driving on, and it's moving away. Okay, It's moving along that circular path. So at this time here, the vehicle approaches. And the green line shows the probability of payment for taking sensor readings, which, as we would expect, shoots up when the vehicle's nearby and drops back down when the vehicle moves away. During the time that the vehicle's nearby, the node spends less of its time listening for incoming radio messages because it's suddenly being paid a lot more to aggregate and transmit its data to the base station because it, now it has data to send. Aggregate? What's there to aggregate? You're not hearing anything from other people. You're aggregating your own samples together. So you have a choice. You either get to take a sample and transmit it, or take several samples, aggregate them together, and transmit it. Um, but there's a caveat here, which is because this node gets very excited, it starts using more of its energy. So its energy budget drops down to zero, which means that it has to sleep. <laughs> so this is a little funny. It means that. Because transmitting consumes so much radio energy, uh, so, so much battery, uh, so much energy, it means I'm now sort of forced to, to sleep during the, during the time that it mattered the most. OK? So maybe what we want to do here is think about you know, allowing the node to hoard a little bit more energy and maybe use a different energy reserve for times when it's excited or something like that. There's some interesting questions about how to fix this problem. The big gap in listen there seems concerning because what if you're on the base station side of the vehicle's path which means now all the base station's hearing is your report and it would like to also be getting information from your neighbors but mm -hmm. you know you're not being very helpful here because so that's that's absolutely right so the way to fix that of course is to bring the prices for listen and aggregation and transmission more within the same range so that the node will do more of those things the way the prices are set here i don't remember the exact values but they were nodes were given priority to transmit and aggregate over listening. Yes? Um, you're estimating the probability of being paid all the time, right? Yes. So I think I understand 
in each case except for aggregate what what that is. So I guess in listen, you you measure how many times people at your in aggregate, um, the probability of being paid for it is, I'm trying to remember, I think you, it's possible that you always get paid to do that because there's no condition there. It's basically I aggregate values together and in this case what we're doing is we're taking the maximum sensor, sensor reading from all the, sen all, the, all the values that I've collected. So you always get paid to aggregate. So beta is always one. Uh, let me keep going because I don't want to run too much out of time. Yes. Why, does it, why did the energy body shoot up while, while the tank was approaching? Ah, that's interesting. Well, what's happening here is the node initially spends more and more of its time sampling. It's not quite at the point where it's transmitting yet because it's sampling and it's aggregating. So it hasn't started sample, uh, sensing yet. The listen action consumes a fair amount of energy. It's doing less of that, so it's basically hoarding more energy. We didn't tell it to do this. It's just evaluating these utility functions and learning the beta parameters. I mean, this is, this is not program behavior. This is emergent. Um, all right. Uh, one thing that we can do with prices that's kind of interesting is by giving different nodes different sets of prices, we can cause them to behave very differently. So for example, we could take, say, 10% of the nodes in the network and give them prices just for listening and transmitting data. And those are now routers. The prices for the other actions are zero. What's that? Are you going to choose which 10%? Yeah, we just randomly pick 10%. OK? Um, and we can give all the other nodes simply uh, prices for sampling and transmission. So they're just simple sensors. They're dumb. All right? So simply by giving them different price vectors, they behave differently. And this is just showing over time the proportion of actions taken by each, by each set of nodes. So this is an interesting way of in some sense, controlling network behavior just by assigning different prices. Yes? So it'd be interesting to see whether you can actually engineer this behavior uh, by itself, meaning I, I think in early comments was that if you have feedback, right? Uh -huh. And I can imagine the kind of interesting behavior you would see would be for sensors in a region which has a lot of activity, yes. then perhaps, uh, say, 20% of sensors would not sample. And instead, they do something right. else. That's they can right. actually specialize to different roles. Mm -hmm. Because oversampling a region is redundant. That's right. right. Now, that's only actually is uh, possible if you have feedback of sensor telling yes. each other that I'm seeing very similar data as you see, and therefore it's so correlated, and therefore I should go to do something mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I wonder if uh, that kind of collaborative behavior you can actually engineer or use these kind this of This is something that we're working on, which has to do with nodes basically changing the prices within the network. So no could tell its neighbors, hey, this is my state, so you should affect your own utility function in the following way so that we don't have redundant actions. Or, you know, if, hey, if I'm noticing something interesting, all of you guys should start sampling more frequently, even though you don't think you should. I'm going to induce you to do that more because we think something interesting is happening nearby. It seems like that would be the essential feature of a marketplace. In other words, it seems yes. like it's not really a marketplace. These aren't really markets in the sense that they're all individual. They don't interact with each other. Right. So right. far, what we don't have yet is, I'm going to get to this in a minute, is, is I haven't presented really a, a notion of a market so much as a reinforcement learning based scheduling technique. Mm -hmm. but this isn't a market because everybody prints their own money and nobody spends it. Uh, that's not really necessary, as it turns out, from the economics literature point of view. Spending money is not necessary. Who's spending the money is the base station. The base station is spending money by the nodes being paid to take these actions. So from the economics, the pure abstract theoretical point of view, it is market. Yes? So uh, from the economic principles, you should not be doing, uh, you should not be enforcing a cost system like this. Uh, the nodes should specialize on their own based on just the market uh, prices and so on. Uh, you should not be forcing them to be routers or sensors. Uh, you're right about that. What, yes, and I, we actually have a student working on exactly that approach, which is how do the nodes, effectively they're pay, to get the nodes to pay each other yeah. to, to act as, so I, you can pay me and I'll act as a router for you. We're working on that right now. I'm just showing this as an example of by setting the prices by hand, what you can accomplish. Um, all right, I promise that the main goal here was really energy efficiency. So I'm going to try to illustrate that. The, this is a graph of the total um, energy used by individual nodes in the network over time. So each dot 
means that at this moment in time, some node in the network had consumed up to that amount of energy. Okay, and there's 100 nodes in the network, so there's a lot of dots. Um, the energy budget, that 1,000 joules per day, is this purple line here. So that's the, the, the cap. That's the total amount that it's allowed to use. The static scheduling, I'm sorry, the static scheduling is the blue line here. And what you're going to notice is it doesn't hug the line because every node was pre-programmed to say, well, I'm going to take a set of actions over some interval. But if, say, for example, I turn on my radio and no data comes in, then I don't have anything to aggregate or transmit, so I don't need to do those actions. So I'm conservative, in other words. I may not use all of my energy budget doing the static scheduling. I may undershoot. The dynamic scheduling, though, proactively tries to hug the line. And as you see, it does that. Okay, It's, exa it's doing what it's supposed to do. But what's happening here in the market-based approach is that a lot of nodes are using very, very little energy because they haven't been excited to do anything else. They're basically saving energy because they haven't learned that it would be profitable for them to sample or to transmit or to do anything else. So they're saving a lot of energy. But you saw earlier that you know these two systems are using a lot more energy, but they got roughly, roughly the same accuracy in terms of the tracking. Another way of thinking about this is efficiency. And my metric here, and I think this is a very important metric um, to think about, is the, the efficiency, the energy efficiency of the system is the total energy used to actually collect meaningful sensor data at the base station, meaning data that resulted in position estimates of the vehicle being tracked, useful data divided by the total amount of energy used by all the nodes in the network. OK, so for example, every node that, that listens and receives a message and forwards it to the base station and samples, and all that energy is counted as being useful energy, energy that resulted in the base station learning something. All the other energy that was used was wasted energy because it didn't result in new data arriving at the base station. For example, if I turn on my radio to listen for an incoming radio message and nothing comes in, that was wasted energy. Does this make sense so far? Yes? Why does the efficiency go up when you supply more energy? You, most, most things get less efficient to use if they are. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you. Let, let, me, let me explain this, and I'll tell you. Okay. So if you look at the numbers here, what we did was we took two energy budgets, one which is 1,000 joules per day and another which is 3,000 joules per day. And what we see is, in all cases, we're more energy efficient, meaning the nodes waste less energy. Now, the reason they do this is that they're dynamically tuning the rate at which they do each action based on whether it was profitable. So they're learning not to waste energy. This is not incredibly efficient, but of course, neither of these. Okay? This 95% efficiency, that means that only 5% of the energy used by the whole network was wasted in data not arriving at the base station. That's an amazing, that's amazing result. The reason that they become more efficient when you provide them a bigger energy budget is that they are less constrained by the actions they can take. When the energy budget is 3,000 joules per day, it's effectively unlimited. Meaning that problem we discussed earlier where a node would take the really low energy actions because that's all the energy it has, doesn't happen here. So that suggests that this is a problem that we do need to solve. But I okay. know the other two also increase in efficiency. There's something funny going on. Uh, but they're doing something very, very similar. And in fact, this is, this is not much of an increase. Yeah. So have, you, have you plotted uh, curves that trade off energy and precision? Because you can compute the average energy. That's yeah, we have a lot of stuff on this in our paper. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, the more energy available, the, the much better the results are. No, I, I mean, in comparison to other techniques, the other techniques are spending some energy and giving you some precision. Uh -huh. So you have it in two separate graphs, but you could somehow put them on the same graph. You compute the uh, average energy being spent. And as you increase the, uh, increase the average energy, yes. you get more and more precision. I think, I think we have these so graphs in the paper. what curves look like and what are the intersections? Yeah, it's very difficult. We, don't have a, we have points. We don't have full curves because each one of these simulations takes hours to run. And so we haven't tested with all the possible points. Hey, what, what you just part of that? If you have some metric like uh, bit precision per joule type yes, of uh, right. metric, then potentially can actually use that to 
uh, engineer some interesting behavior when this agent take action. Yes. If it's uh, you know, doing gradient ascent in, in that uh -huh, particular uh -huh, direction. Uh -huh, so right. right. And that's the that's the local gradient that you want to establish. Yes. Yes. If you believe economics is a, is a business of allocating scarce or relatively scarce resources, this 36% means something is badly broken with your, with your allocation model at a, at a 0.7 watt. Well, what's probably happening here, because the th it's, again, it's 1,000 joules per day, it's a very limited energy budget, the nodes are effectively the exploration cost of doing actions that were potentially not profitable is hurting them more. No, the random stuff is hurting them more. The random stuff is hurting them more. Waiting that uh, two thirds of the energy goes on random stuff because that's only if that is uh, uh, no. Let me tell you another reason why. Okay, you have to keep in mind. I'm counting the useful energy as only data that eventually arrived at the base station. So here's the problem. With the low energy budget, not enough nodes may turn on their radio because they don't have enough energy to do it. So if I generate data and transmit it to you and you're not listening, wasted energy. Oh, so this doesn't take the utility of the data into account, though. It's basically counting how many packets arrive at the base station. What do you mean utility of the data? What, so from what you just said, it sounds like if you, take, if you just sample all the time, and transmit all that data back all the time, then you'd be at 100% efficiency even if the tag never went through the, the network. So this is not useful uh, data per se. No. Um, uh, for that matter, if you only transmit it You would normally be right, screen. except for what's happening is we're only transmitting data for, I mean, the, the, sense, the samples of when the tank's nowhere nearby get rejected by the nodes anyway, so they never get transmitted. Mm -hmm. It's part of the, the getting paid for doing that action. Let me keep going because I, I want to finish up here. But let me talk briefly about where we're going with this. So what I've been mainly talking about here is a case where the nodes are adaptively learning their schedule. Now, the, going back to markets and what, what you just said about you know, allocating scarce resources, that's really what this should be about, which is we've got multiple competing users fighting over a scarce resource, and we want to allocate those resources in a decentralized fashion. So this is work in progress is what we're working on right now. Um, the context is we're, um, I'm not actually doing vehicle tracking at Harvard, so one of the things we are doing is medical sensor networks. And the idea here is that you'd have a lot of different patients outfitted with wireless sensors that, in this case, I've got a, um, an EKG that we developed and a pulse oximeter. Both of these are, I mean, I can talk to you more about them later if you're curious, but these are vital sign monitors based on the moats. You've got some other moats. Maybe these are on other patients. Maybe these are fixed in the building or something, okay, but they're there to route data. And a doctor might say, for example, I want to receive an update on patient A every 30 seconds and look at that data on my PDA. Okay, we have a PDA application. It's actually using uh, .NET Compact Framework. It's pretty cool. Uh, and um, so that data would get routed back to the doctor through some path. And we were using an ad hoc multicast routing protocol to do that. And this EMT down here may say, well, I only want to receive updates on patient B when they're critical. In other words, when their heart rate goes beyond some, <laughs> some um, certain percentage. And let's say the data gets routed through this central node here. So now we've obviously got you know, some contention where we've got limited bandwidth here, but we've got two users that want this data, and they're fighting over this limited bandwidth and energy. So what we really are working on right now is using this market-based idea to, to get true equilibrium in the network. Um, so the idea is every user would specify utility function as part of their query. Now, hopefully a nurse or a doctor doesn't, doesn't have to enter curves and things like that. So we'll have to make that easy to use. But, but this allows someone to express their trade-offs in terms of the latency or the quality or the rate of the data that they're getting. And this makes a lot of sense in a medical context. If I can only hear from a patient once a minute, I want to hear you know, heart rate and you know, blood oxygen saturation. Whereas if I can hear from them, if I'm standing right next to them and I can get their data you know, at, at a very high rate, I want the full EKG signal trace. Okay, so these trade-offs do make sense. So we want to use this MBM approach to get a, a, an efficient decentralized allocation. And the basic way you do this, of course, is you find prices for each action so that the supply of goods equals the demand of the goods. And that's the definition of Pareto optimality. A lot of work has been done on how to do this in market-based systems using centralized techniques where you collect the supply information, you collect the demand information, you adjust the prices, you re-advertise the prices. But that's a centralized process. And as I said at the beginning, we want to avoid centralized techniques. So how do you do this? Well, we're going after 
some approximations, which may not be as efficient as doing it in a centralized way, but if it is decentralized and scalable, that works well for us. Um, so the idea is that we'll do things like adjust the prices within the network and piggyback the prices on other messages so that we're not wasting um, opportunities to transmit with this overhead, hopefully. Yeah? Uh, one comment regarding scarcity. I don't think the scarcity necessarily uh, forces optimality, increases allocation. In cases where you are not uh, capable of making incremental decisions, incremental actions. For example, in the doctor's office, the doctor thinks that the patient might have a brain tumor. The doctor can take the patient to go and have an MRI. But the doctor doesn't have a cheaper option. The doctor cannot do something that's half the cost of an MRI and get half. Oh, of I see what you're getting at. Yes. So, so, and that was that was sort of what you were you had in your network. There were sort of quants of information and quants of price that you could get. Right. And because of that, you need to expand the budget so that it becomes kind of um, small. It is becomes mm -hmm. incremental in terms of the total budget. Right, right, and, right, right. And, and I think that's true even in these larger networks. That's, mm -hmm. that's the reason why there is national debt as well. I see. I mean, yeah, so these are things, so David and I have been talking about a lot of these. And, and it, it's very interesting because the theoretical work that's been done in this area, it's hard to see how it applies in a sensor network context. So. We may have to abandon kind of traditional ways of thinking about economics. And I'm not wedded to economics, so to speak. We're using them as an inspiration. But if we have to develop something different that's going to work, that's good. Do you have a question, Alec? Yeah, I'm trying to approach a more fundamental question of like, uh, when I think about economics or uh, market-based uh, algorithms, they're thinking about trying to reach an equilibrium with individual uh, agents uh, doing selfishly, for example or as a cooperative, cooperative games. That's right. But uh, in sensor networks, you're probably not going to see equilibrium. Like the tanks move around, it's actually creating this, this, this equilibrium. That's right. Then how are you going to actually apply uh, markets which try to obtain equilibrium to solve this problem? And especially when right. you have things that is uh, actually co correlations it's a very important thing where it goes beyond the individual agent. That's right. And the color and the coloration has to actually also change too. So, mm -hmm. so that's why it's, I'm just trying to understand. Is this the right approach after? It, it's a good. It, you, you're asking the right question. I, I don't know the answer yet. We're kind of going after this to understand these exact questions. One of the things we do believe is that we're never going to actually reach equilibrium where everybody's perfectly happy and all the prices are exact because things are changing all the time. People are moving around. Data rates are changing. Um, one of the results that's out there says that if you have an approximate equilibrium, then you have it, it gets closer and closer and closer to optimality. Okay, So that's a good result. That means that if we're slightly out of equilibrium, we're slightly less efficient than we would have been had we been perfect equilibrium, but we're not way on the other end of the scale. And so that's one thing that we're, we're looking forward to doing. But as I said, you know, this is kind of work in progress. So you know, maybe we're going to have to abandon this use of economics if we wanted to get it to really work. But this is what we're going after right now. Yeah. One quick question. Um, in, in this type of scenario, actually missing a critical message has a huge penalty. Yes. I wonder how you actually model that as a, a penalty as part of the cost or, or price you. Good, good point. So. Um, what we have in mind right now is that we do have some sort of prioritization scheme where I can basically say that certain messages are more important than others and thereby get paid, you pay more for them. So the message that a patient stopped breathing or their heart stopped is much more important than some healthy 46-year-old with no history of heart disease sitting in the, um, sitting in the, in the outpatient ward. Okay, so there is definitely a, and, that, and hopefully we capture that with the use of utility functions. That's the idea, is that we have some unified way of expressing our preferences. Be nice. But that's, so that's, our, that's our basic model. Let me, all right, we're working on high level programming languages, which I'm going to skip this, but we'll talk about it later if you want to talk about one on one that compiles down into this model. Um, I already mentioned the future directions. The first thing that we're going after is this idea of richer pricing and learning models, so that, for example, we could price sequences of actions. So we could say it's really valuable if you take several sensor readings and then combine them together and then transmit, because then nodes operate less myopically. Um, I already mentioned this idea of using the market to do uh, multi-user resource allocation. And adjusting the prices, obviously, this is, this is really important. Um, one way we've been playing with this already is 
you could imagine programming certain nodes in the network as sentries. Everybody else has pri no, zero price for everything, so they sleep. Some nodes are awake and they're paying attention. They're cognizant of the environment. And when they see an interesting event, they propagate new prices to their neighbors that say, hey, wake up. You need to start taking action now. So the price propagation can be a form of distributed control. Um, all right, so just to wrap up. I mean, basically, what we're interested in here is new techniques for doing resource allocation in sensor nets. And we started with this project thinking about how do you program a sensor network using prices. We ended up at a place where we said, well, the, the, core, the, the core problem we're addressing is how do I schedule the operations of individual nodes adaptively so that they use their energy wisely? And the main technique that came out of that was a real simple form of reinforcement learning. Going back to the economic side of things, it started within the context of can we use markets and economics? And so we think that that problem really comes back when we talk about multiple users fighting for some limited bandwidth. Less interesting on the individual node scheduling case, but these two do hook together. So um, I think the, the pointers here, we have a paper on this that's going to appear in NSDI. Uh, and we also have a position paper about this idea that we already presented at the SIGOPS European Workshop. And my web page and email are there. So thank you very much. Thanks. I'll take any other questions now. Yes? Uh, you, you had one explanation for this funny uh, behavior, which is that uh, at low energy, people talk when others don't listen and listen when others don't talk. Now, the obvious fix of that is not to do with pricing, but with synchronization. Look at the Wilderness Protocol of radio hams. Yes. Six yes. time right. when people listen and talk, That's right. and other times they don't. That's right. So one thing that we've been playing with as well is could nodes not learn just, an, just a sort of an expected profit for each action at some arbitrary point in time, but learn that over different time slices, time slots. So I could learn, you know, Feng was sending me messages at these at some regular interval. I would learn that it was profitable for me to turn on my radio and listen at these time slots, and I would turn off my radio at other times. So it's kind of a self-organizing TDMA. So we're actually playing with that idea. And it doesn't require a lot more state. You just have to remember the, the a, a beta for each action at each time, time slice, not just for all time. Um, but the real problem that we're having there was not really that they were tra not transmitting listening at the same time. It was that with a low energy budget, uh, listening was too expensive energy-wise. So fewer nodes were doing it, so less data was getting through. And so what you want to do there, obviously, is you know, raise the price for listening to cause more nodes to do it. Anything else? OK, well, thanks a lot. I'd like to hear from you over email or in person what you think about all this. And you know, thanks for your, your comments and questions were very helpful. Thanks. thanks.